This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 133. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. I'm so grateful to have you here with me again on this beautiful, beautiful day. We're meeting again to talk about all things mental health, all things anxiety, all things depression, all things mental wellness, all my favorite topics. We have such an important conversation happening today on the podcast and I cannot wait to share that with you but before I do let's get through a couple of housekeeping shall we all right number one the 2020 OCD Game Changers conference is back I am so excited to be asked again to attend and speak at this event And again, it's in Denver, where it was last year. Such an amazing event. If you can get yourself there because it was just so empowering and the advocates are incredible and it was just such a beautiful, beautiful event. So OCD Game Changes will be on March 7th of 2020 between 10 and 6 p.m. That's a mountain time, but if you're there, you'll be on that time and it will be in Denver. So if you're wanting information, you can click on the link here in the show notes that will get you directly to the sign up page. Otherwise, if you are just listening, go to ocdgamechanges.com forward slash events forward slash. Again, those also will be in the show notes so that you guys can get your tickets fast. Um, Before you know it, March is going to be here. Okay, let's do the I did a hard thing segment. Oh, this one is so good. All right. This is from a valued CBT school campus, the Facebook group, and they are such a valued member there. And they have said, I have an eating disorder and OCD. I've gone six days without checking serving sizes, nutrition labels, weighing myself and measuring my body. Oh my goodness. Let me just stop there and say that is such a huge, huge accomplishment. I know this. I know this struggle. This is an exposure that is very, very difficult. And I remember going through that myself. So amazing work. I'm so cheering you on over here. And she went on to say, it's kind of unbearable because I have to eat six times a day, right? And I can feel my body is getting bigger, but I can't chart exactly how much. I can't avoid or ignore how my body feels because I live in it. And I have SPD, so I'm hyper aware of how my clothes fit different, right? And I think you're talking about sensory processing disorder when you say SPD. All of this combined is about the most overwhelmed I can get but I'm still mostly sticking to my plan. Oh my goodness, this is so amazing. What an amazing thing they're doing. So many hard things and back to back, it sounds like. So thank you so much for sharing that amazing, amazing contribution. We are cheering you on. All right, let's get to the episode. Today, we have an amazing guest who... I am so grateful for they reached out to me in the middle of 2019 and asked to be on the podcast with me not knowing who this person was and me not knowing the topic, actually never having heard the topic. And you know what? It's crazy to me how things come to you at exactly the right time. This book that Dr. Margaret Robinson Rutherford has written, which is called Perfectly Hidden Depression, is 
I think it's just going to resonate with you guys so much. It resonated with me so much. I saw myself in this book so much. I saw myself in these concepts and topics so much. And to be honest, I see so many of my clients and you guys in these topics as well. So I really think that this is something that you are all going to benefit from talking about this concept of perfectly hidden depression. So number one, thank you to Dr. Margaret Robertson Rutherford for coming on. It was such a powerful and you know, eye-opening conversation and one that I really wanted to share with you all. So I will not keep going on. I will let you get straight to the good stuff. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you guys next week. Well, welcome everybody. This is going to be a very fun episode because we have here with us Dr. Margaret Robinson Rutherford, who is bringing to us a topic that I had never heard of in my clinical work or my research. And I think this is going to resonate with so many of you. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here as well. I told you as we were talking right before that I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and I love your approach. And it's just, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. I think that this is going to blow some people's minds. So I was so blessed for you and your team to reach out to me and send me your book, Perfectly Hidden Depression. And it's called How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. And it's funny because I was just having this conversation with a friend where we were tossing up how sometimes it doesn't look like depression, but what is it? So I would love to hear from you, what is perfectly hidden depression? Okay. The topic of perfectly hidden depression found me, Kimberly. I did not ever have plans to write a book. I have been a therapist for over 25 years. I love what I do. It's an honor to be involved in people's lives like that. But I had started blogging back in 2012. I had some, my son had graduated from high school and he was gone. And so I just began writing about empty nest. And then I thought, no, I want to write about mental health. So I started drmargaretrutherford.com, which is my website. And in April of 2014, I was sitting in my sunroom just thinking, well, what do I want to write about today? And I started thinking about some people that I'd seen over the years that walked in and didn't seem depressed at all. They're very successful, engaged, productive, connected kind of people. And yet what I began noticing about them was that when they were describing certain painful events in their lives or even what I would call trauma, they wouldn't, but I would call trauma, they had very little expression, emotional expression about it. In fact, When I delved a little more deeply into it, I realized that they didn't really have the capacity or seeming capacity to express pain of any kind. And so the work became very different. And the work involved not trying to get them to engage outwardly. They had that down pat, but was to engage inwardly. And so I started thinking about these people and I just came up with the phrase, perfectly hidden depression. Because as my work uh, continued with them, they did begin to talk about loneliness, despair, emptiness, suicidality, shame, incredible self-loathing that they were trying to take care of either through addictions or eating disorders or other kinds of things that were more diagnosable. But they, they really were surprised when I started throwing the depression word around. But anyway, so I wrote this post. And at the time, oh, I was lucky, you know, if 50 shares of my post were, you know, here I am in Arkansas. And 1,500 shares later, in a day, I was like, oh, my gosh, something's going on. And at the time, I was writing for the Huffington Post, and I posted it there, or they posted it for me. They were kind enough to do that. And I forgot that I had left my email on the bottom of the post And within 24 hours, I'd gotten hundreds of emails from people who were saying, this is me. How did you figure this out? I've never heard anybody talk about this. What's it called? Where'd you, you know, can I talk to you? And, but don't tell anybody I emailed you. (laughs) 
So I began looking, and believe it or not, I I didn't even know who Brene Brown was at the time. I guess my head was under a rock, or I was living under one or something. And I found her work, which was incredible. But I didn't find any, and there was one more book. There was a book by Terrence Real called I Don't Want to Talk About It that was mentioning covert depression in men as being different from women's expression of depression. But I couldn't find any popular psychologist writing about this true connection between the perfect looking life being a, an overlooked presentation of depression that we as a profession are missing because we're not looking for it. We're not, we're not tuned into it as well as we could be. So now what that was 2014. I now have a book out and, but that was a long, which I will not bore your listeners. Uh, it's a long journey. I was unknown. I still am, you know, relatively unknown. And so, but I wasn't, I didn't care about, getting myself out there, I cared about getting the message. And that is what has driven me for five years to get this message out. In fact, several people came to me to be interviewed. They volunteered to be interviewed, talking secretly in their offices or in their garages. And one lady who had been quite well put together during the interview, I was laughing about that it was getting difficult to find a publisher who would publish it because I didn't have a platform big enough. And she said she got really quiet and I could hear her getting upset. And she said, please don't stop. Please get this message out. And I've heard that over and over from people who are tired of looking perfect and want to. They know something's wrong. They just don't know what's wrong. Right. And that's what resonated so much with me. I mean, I know the diagnostic criteria for depression. Right. And then then there's this other way that it looks. And as you've explained, and I'd love for you to kind of put, you know, the 10 characteristics, share some of those with us is we do overlook the person who is functioning and appears to be doing really well, but is actually struggling deep down. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people have said, is this the same thing as high functioning depression or smiling depression? And I do think there's a subgroup who sort of know what they're doing. They know they're depressed. They may have even been diagnosed with depression, but they put a smile on their face every day and they go out there. But those are, I am talking to those people, but there's another entirely different group that has done this for so long that actually all that underground activity, all that rigid compartmentalization, all that shaming has has stayed very unconscious. And it is about, as Freud would have said to us years ago, it is about bringing into the conscious what has been unconscious. So that is difficult work as for the person, and it's and it can be trying and but challenging for the therapist as well. Can you share with us some of the characteristics, just so that the listeners, um, of course, they can go and read your book, which in detail will explain them. But can you sort of explain what it really would look like from the characteristics? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I called it perfectly hidden depression. As I said, the the term just sort of came to me. And I literally sat down and thought, okay, these people that I, and I I put them down on paper and I noted some of their characteristics. And I thought, do these hang together? I term it a syndrome. It is not a diagnosis. A syndrome is like uh, a codependence is probably the most well-known syndrome. It is a group of beliefs or behaviors that tend to be found together, right? And nobody called what codependent people were doing codependence until a group of them got together and said, oh, do you do that? I do that. (laughs) Do you feel that way? I feel that way. And so codependence was born. Perfectly hidden depression, like I said, is a term that I created to talk about this syndrome. And the characteristics or the common traits of it are perfectionism, But perfectionism, that's not just striving for excellence. It's fueled by this critical, constant inner voice of shame. You can never be enough, do enough, make enough, create enough, be enough. And and, and you aren't. So you have this voice inside of you that's always just telling you how bad a person you are. The second is a a true sense of over-responsibility where 
you've got your hand up in the air all the time. You have to take a lot of responsibility. You're also very, very task oriented. And actually, you get your sense of competence and achievement through tasks. You discount any kind of early trauma or experience. You will say, my life was fine. That's not a big deal. If a therapist says something like, well, that's trauma, you go, it's not trauma. I'll tell you what real trauma is. So there's a discounting or even denial of that. I had a guy one time who said he was laughing, quote unquote, as he told me how his mother used to throw rocks at him. And I looked at him and said, do you know that's not normal? That that's a traumatic experience for a child. And he just stopped in his tracks and said, I've never even thought about it like this, just what it was. So also these people have distinct trouble expressing emotional pain. Interestingly, there's some researchers in Canada, Gordon Flett and Paul Hewitt, who've done wonderful research, and they led me to the idea that basically perfectionists know how to identify emotions. They can tell you, oh, yes, I feel sad. That makes me sad. They cannot express it. They have trouble being in the emotion. Some of the others are a lot of worry and a need to feel in control. Being a great friend, being a very sincerely great friend, caring a lot about other people, but nobody knows you too well. You don't really let anybody into what's going on with you. Probably a lot of therapists are like this. Believing very strongly and counting your blessings, but it is to it is what John Cobbett Zinn calls rigid positivity. That you you have to stay very positive. You don't even allow yourself to think about the underbelly of things or the things that are underneath that may be painful. Another one is the co- a co-occurrence of an actual diagnostic problem, such as obsessive compulsive traits, generalized anxiety, even some bipolar two addictions, eating disorders, anything having to do with loss of control or control. But I do talk about that in the book because there are distinctions. And then the last one is that you are usually, because we really support these kinds of behaviors in the workplace and volunteering, is that you're usually very successful, but you don't have a lot of emotional success. I mean, you might look like you have a great relationship, but that relationship is either based on both of you needing to look perfect or you being an over over functioner or very over-responsible in the relationship. Or even narcissists love these kinds of people. So anyway, you're, you usually are, there's some dysfunction in your relationship. Right. This was so interesting to me because you talked about the inner and outer levels of relationships, right? Yeah. And how a big piece of this is, like you said, letting people in to your inner world of what's really going on for you. Um, what did that look like for the people you were, you were treating and the people you were talking to? Mm, That's a great question. A lot of people have asked me, do I have this? Do I struggle with this? And certainly perfectionism has been something that I've struggled with all my life. And I have, I've been divorced twice and I was moving back to Arkansas to a small town. And I remember telling my therapist that I would never tell anyone that I'd been divorced twice because I was afraid of judgment. Sure enough, I moved here and I had a patient sitting in front of me and she said, well, I'm getting a divorce and it's the second one, but you would not know what that would be like. And I looked at her and said, you're joining a club that I've been a member of for a long time. It was at that moment that I began to realize that these things that we fear, that if we share them, our mistakes, our vulnerabilities, whatever we want, our struggles, that there's great empowerment actually in sharing them with other people. And that is what I try to guide my patients to do, to say, okay, try to find that one person that you somehow have a feeling that if that they've either told you something about themselves or someone they love that you think, okay, I think they'd be safe. Sometimes that's a therapist. But other times there are people in your world that if you just even risk, risk saying, you know, I'm not always who I seem to be. And they look at you and they say, what do you mean? And you say, well, I'm not ready even to tell you that yet, but I wanted to venture into just saying to you, sometimes I'm not putting on an act, but it's hard for me to be vulnerable. 
And they'll go, well, you know, you never talk about yourself or something like that. Now, like one man, I told one guy a couple of years ago that I had a panic disorder, that I had anxiety. And he looked at me and he said, no, you? No, you don't. You're so extroverted and you look so comfortable. So some people around people like this will sort of dismiss it and go, oh, come on, you know. But you, it, it is part of the work is definitely beginning to open up. Right. And it's amazing because I think you writing this helps educate the person who is married to someone with perfectly hidden depression or friends with understand that the happy face doesn't necessarily mean that everything is fine. No. In fact, on the I did I do a podcast also. It's called Self Work with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. And I did one this morning recorded it. And I was, uh, I had been sent an email from someone with perfectly hidden depression who identified with it. And she said, when she told her family that her husband said, oh, I've known you were depressed. I just haven't known how to talk to you about it. And her son said, mom, I never see your laughter reach your eyes. So she said, gosh, when I, when I told him, when I, he, I heard that I was just so, blown away that he would sense that there was something about me that I I can't get to my joy. In fact, Kimberly, that's often what happens. People cut off their sorrow. They they detach from the things that make them very sad. They're also sort of cutting off the upper tones of that palette of, I don't know how to be really joyful. I don't know how to belly laugh. It's like they're living a very restricted or constricted emotional palette. Right. And I think that a lot of my listeners will really resonate with that, particularly because with anxiety, they're constantly trying to just push it away. Oh, yeah, I have anxiety. I know. <laughs> uh, but when you push it away, it does sort of limit your ability to reach joy and, and laughter. Like you're saying, I think that that's very, very true. Um, and I've seen that a lot in my practice as well. I bet you have. I hear, I see that you're an expert on OCD and good, congratulations to you. That's a hard field to be in. So, but yeah, I call my anxiety, Bob. And I said, <laughs> Bob's here. <laughs> And Bob's giving me, in fact, I think if you detach a lot from your anxiety and just kind of see it as not you, but and you're the expert, but it really can help. And so Bob comes to visit every now and then. Bob's with me right now a little bit. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> right. And you can identify that and, and make space for it. So I'm going to quote you here because there was one part of the book that I love. You wrote, with perfectly hidden depression, the overall goal of healing is to connect the person with their internal world. Right. Now that I think that was the big word that the thing that hit me of like, okay, there's a little bit of, you know, there's the direction. That's would right. that be first sharing, you know, or would that first be doing that deeper inner work with on your own first? Like where would you lead us? Sure. Sure. You know, there are over 60 exercises or reflections, whatever you want to call them that I wrote in the book. To, it's almost more of a workbook, really, but it is a very self-guided. And if you get to, if it gets too difficult, I recommend all the way through the book to seek treatment. But I think the first parts of it are looking into your inner experience and trying to begin to understand and see some of the patterns to understand the rules you've been living by, to understand the feelings you don't allow yourself to have. In fact, one of the very early exercises is what are feelings you can't seem to connect with and what are the feelings you can? And so you begin to do this sort of map yourself out. And, you know, there's different stages of this, but one very important stage is to go back and almost do a timeline of your life with compassion just like you would be listening to someone else's story and to begin to uh, look at the things that happened to you that maybe you caused to happen to you or that happened to you without any kind of you having anything to do with it and to begin both good things and bad things and begin to assess what would any child feel if that had happened to them. That's the compassion part. And to go back and then to try to track that and see how those things are impacting your daily life now. It's amazing to me, and maybe you find this as well, that that people seem somewhat astonished 
as something that happened when they were eight or or six or two or ten would if it was important, if it was significant enough, would be impacting them and they wouldn't know it. So it's raising your own awareness and raising your acceptance of that. And so, you know, whereas when you have someone depressed with clinical, with traditional depression, they're extremely engaged with their inner world. In fact, they have a, a lot of, perhaps irrationally, but they have a lot of trouble connecting outside of themselves. The work is, the direction is opposite in perfectly hidden depression. I have to get these people to stop focusing on everyone else in their lives and to start focusing on what's going on inside of them that they have not wanted to see or it is way, it's very frightening to look at. Right. It's funny for me because I'll be really open. Sure. This book is exactly me 15 years ago. Yeah. Right. At the beginning of I had an eating disorder. This is why this book blew me away. You know, this was perfectly me. And I will never forget talking through, I had this excessive, like almost compulsive work ethic. Yeah, sure. And we were talking with my therapist about, you know, why I have that and going back into finding that when I was a young child, my family lives on a a farm, a ranch in Australia. And we went through this very, very terrible drought where we lost a ton of water and, you know, we had to save water and everyone bathed in the same bath water because we were very limited. And I was sharing with her this story and she almost looked like she was going to tear up. And she said, that must have been so painful for you. And my immediate reaction was no. Right. Right. No. That happened to everybody in my neighborhood. That's not trauma. That's what happened to everybody in my, you know, in the community. Sure. And by um, that was the first like light moment where she said, no, that was a big trauma in your life. You know, even though, it, you know, we compare to, I think, death and sexual assault in terms of trauma often. And sure. that was a, so for me, that exact experience was sort of what you're saying. Exactly. And, you know, if it's shared trauma or if it's or if you've heard of something worse or that only happened once or when my buddy got killed, you know, when you saw him get killed. I mean, you know, it's like people. I I don't want anyone to walk around feeling victimized. That's not what I'm espousing at all. I don't want people to walk around in their victimization or in their trauma. But we, the the word for me is acknowledgement. We want we need to go back and acknowledge what that was really like and exactly what you're saying. By the way, we're all praying for your country, for Australia. Uh, y'all have some terrible, awful things going on right now. So, but even though that trauma was shared, it was a fairly sudden, strong interruption, significant interruption in what was the norm. And there was deprivation involved. There was fear involved. There was the unknown involved. I'm sure the adults were scared out of their minds, how many of their their livelihood was going to leave. And so, you know, yeah, it's, that's trauma. (laughs) Yeah. It, that is just, it blew me away. Again, I really respect you for the work that you're doing here in, in bringing these ideas you know, obviously people's experiences into this book. Can you share with me, you've got in the book, the five C's of the healing process. Now I know again, everyone will need to read the book to really get a really great grasp on that. And the exercises are amazing. Um, But would you share the five C's of the healing process? I have to tell you a funny story. Okay. When I wrote the book, I wasn't thinking about treatment. I was thinking about, I want to describe this. And the publishing company that ended publishing it said, we won't publish it unless you develop a treatment strategy and you have two weeks. (laughs) And I said, oh my gosh, you know, Bob was talking to me for sure. (laughs) I bet he was. And so I gulped and I thought, all right, this was like November of 2017. So I had two weeks. And I thought, about, okay, what do I do 
with every patient that I see. I, I don't have to develop a new strategy. I have to maybe think about it in a way that, that I have done it. You know, it will be what I, what comes out of my brain and my heart and my mind, but you know, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. And so I thought, okay, the first thing is consciousness. You have to call a problem a problem. And a lot of perfectionists don't call being a perfectionist a problem. In fact, it's their best friend. If you've had anorexia, you know your anorexia can be feel like your best friend too. The second step was fighting the commitment, finding a way to stay committed to the process. And there are a lot of hurdles for that with this particular problem because, again, no one's looking at you and saying, what's wrong? You don't see yourself. You know, what's going on? In fact, you just got a promotion or you're getting kudos for doing something incredibly well. And so, you know, there's a lot and there, there's pushback. There are all kinds of things. A lot of times people will start out with something way too hard that are perfectionists. The third one is more based on cognitive behavioral kinds of work where we're looking at the rules that you are following that don't fit your life anymore, but you are you are making them important to you because it doesn't feel safe to not follow them. And so we begin to look at how you dismantle the ones that aren't working for you anymore and that are getting in the way of true self-awareness and fulfillment and the ones that are working for you and why are they working for you and why do you want to hold on to them because they are really good. The fourth one is something I've already mentioned, which is uh, connection, where you go back. And so the third one, I'm sorry, is confrontation. So consciousness, commitment, confrontation of the rules, connection with these emotions that you have rigidly and at this point, sometimes even unconsciously begun to you, you have compartmentalized, you have pushed away, you have dissociated almost, if you want to use that term, from them. I'll never forget a, a lady. I, she was a gift. She was such a gift because she was brilliant. And she came in because she'd read about perfectly hidden depression and she wanted help with it. And her work really coincided with me writing the book. And it, I was writing this chapter when she finally discovered that she was angry about some sexual abuse that had happened to her in college. And she, she said, am I ever not going to be angry? And I said, you don't have any skills you don't know what to do with anger. And so we worked on it and she got more comfortable with it. And she talked with her husband about it. And she said, I can, I, it scares me, but I, I want to feel this anger for the first time in my life. So there's that kind of connection, but it could be with any feeling. So it could be joy. And then the last one that I also firmly believe as a therapist is in change. I think you get hope from insight and understanding why you are who you are. No, I'm sorry. I said that backwards. You get insight from deciding, from figure out why you are who you are. You don't get hope from it, though. You get hope from behavior change. When you see yourself, when you realize you're hungry or you're tired, and instead of making yourself do one more thing on that list, you say, you know, I want to listen to a piece of music and just relax for a second. Or when you are about to raise your hand to take on the third role in your community of the head of the cancer drive, and you say, you know, this year I'm going to take a back seat and I'm going to deal with the feelings of doing that, but I'm going to choose to do that instead of once more piling on something else onto my plate. Or I'm at least going to take something off. <laughs> if it really means something to me. So the, it's consciousness, commitment, confrontation, connection, and change. And again, all along in the book, I try to take you along and hold your hand and hold my hand all at the same time and walk you through exactly how to do that. Right. Do you find that they happen in that order or do people go forward and then go backwards and then loop. Yes. What I have it? a chart in the book that's more like a, the spokes of a bicycle. And if you think of the five stages being on the rim of the bicycle on the wheel and then their spokes, just think as you begin to question a rule you're following, then all of a sudden here comes this feeling or here comes this commitment problem. Well, I can't change that. You know, I can't stop working for 12 hours a day. I have this rule that I must work 12 hours a day because I work at, we're in Walmart country here. So, you know, I work for Walmart. I can't possibly leave at six. Well, you know, let's look at that rule. 
well, here comes, well, this is a stupid idea, <laughs> you know, so they're all interconnected. Again, what, nobody's asked me that question. That's a wonderful question because yes, they, they, they're, it's kind of like a Jenga game or my age pickup sticks. You have to realize what piece, when you draw out a piece, what else gets kind of shaky around you and you have to be careful that, and do it in a very, not in an overly careful way, because sometimes you're going to be hit with some things that are new revelations and new feelings. But to me, I promise you, and I don't mean to be dramatic here, the last few people that I have helped with this, uh, as I call it a syndrome, have looked at me and they've even said, I had an active plan to commit suicide, to die by suicide when I walked in your office. Or they've said, you may have said, this work may have saved my life. So, you know, I don't know if your listeners are aware, but the suicide rates are going up exponentially in almost all age groups except 65 and older. And what the researchers are also showing is that perfectionism and suicidality are, do have a correlation. So, and all of us tragically know someone who died by suicide and we think, but we just saw them last month and they look great or they were thriving. He, yes, they were thriving and they seemed fine. And he was my son's soccer coach, you know, and he was great. And now all of a sudden he's died. So, you know, it's trying to, you know, Brene Brown is just so wonderful talking about this. And she says, you don't get to courage without going through vulnerability. So I'm just, I'm making a further connection between that it's real depression our profession needs to pay attention. Right. I agree. You know, when you talk about the suicide rates, I think about here in California, the, I live in California, the suicide rate of Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I look at how this probably is a very good description for a lot of the people and the children and the adults that are dying by suicide, given that they're highly thriving, succeeding, you know, un, but unable to either access or admit that this is not going well, that they're struggling deeply. Right, right. There's also a wonderful book that Kate Fagan wrote now two or three years ago, I think probably three by now. It was called What Made Maddie Run? And it was about a track star, a college track star named Maddie Holleran, who died by suicide uh, in a very dramatic way. She talks about how she had gifts for her present, for her parents and notes to everyone left at the scene of the suicide. And uh, Kate Fagan was talking about the pressure that college athletes feel. But it's, I think it's, you know, we had, since then there's been Kate Spade, I mean, who actually had been diagnosed with manic depression or bipolar disorder, I think. And, you know, family members at least are saying she didn't, she thought that would sully her brand if anyone knew that. So, you know, the things that we all keep hidden and which really just make us more human. Right, right. I really would love to hear your thoughts about and give some examples of these rules. Like when you're talking about these sort of changing and, and addressing the rules, what might be some examples of rules that you hear people report in this situation? Well, let's say the simple one of I can never let anyone know that I am, uh, let's see, that I was sexually abused. Those words will never come out of my mouth. And why? Why is that? You know, you have to ask yourself, or it can be, you know, there are a lot of families, Kimberly, that actually have the rule of, it's not okay to show your anger. It's not okay to show your sadness. These are the rules that we are living by. In my family, anger wasn't really allowed. And so I, I can remember being a therapist and having to get supervision on when people were really angry with one another in my sessions. I didn't really know how to handle it. And I had to learn how to handle it. My now husband will tell you I learned very well how to handle it. But, you know, these rules that we're following about the things we could never tell anyone, the things we could never allow ourselves to do, it's the shoulds, the musts, the oughts. They're silly ones like don't wear white after Labor Day. You know, you used to be one of them in, in when I was growing up. But there's silly ones. You know, if you were anorexic, you know that people say I can. In fact, I had a patient last year who said, 
she is very tall, but her mother said you should never wear more than a size two. And so she's anorexic because she has swallowed whole, no pun intended, that rule. And so we have these, these, mm, they're greater than commitments. They are, they have become ingrained in who we have to be and feel okay about ourselves when really we do not. When you think about, you know, I have to stay young looking. Well, really? (laughs) What's that about? Do you want to, you know, how much of that is governing your life instead of you governing it? And you deciding when it's okay to not. I went to a Christmas party a couple of weeks ago now, and I had a bunch, I was around a bunch of 30 year olds, and they were talking about microneedling. And I thought, okay, well, they're talking about microneedling. And then I th- got kind of sad and thought, so they're already telling themselves that they need to worry. Their rule is I need to worry about aging. And maybe some of that is prudent and good. And, it, you know, I'm not knocking it, but how much it is, it, is it governing their behavior? Right. I agree so much. I think the one that I see the most in terms of the rules is if I'm not admired, if I'm not achieving to the level of being admired, I'm therefore unlovable or, you know, people won't invest in me because then they're having to achieve at that level. And the, the hard thing has been for me as a clinician is undoing those rules means they do have to be less admired. Yes. Yes. Or they have to, what they're interrupting is affirmation equals value. And so what I will have a patient like that do is do something really well, but they do it without anyone knowing it. Or I'll have them do something inferior intentionally. Yes. Yes. That's (laughs) what we do as well. That's exactly what we do. You know, you begin to shake up this you know, I did something really kind for someone. Now, I will say, though, that people perfectly in depression do tend to have a lot of humility. They don't necessarily want to stay too long in the spotlight. A little bit of the spotlight is great. But again, they one of the rules is don't claim your, you know, don't look narcissistic. Don't look grandiose. Don't you may have won the, the game, but don't flaunt it. Right. You know, so it's not you can even have your moment of joy and pride because the rules say you shouldn't even do that. So I do think that there are shades of subtlety here that are about that's why it's so important for people to write down the rules that they know that they follow. Right. You know, do they have to get affirmed to feel value? Do they shy away from being affirmed? Because then the rule becomes I can't look too grandiose. Or they call it grandiosity. You know, what are the rules very specific to you as a person? And that's where the work is. Right, right. I would love to see some research here on the on how this presents in different countries. Um, oh, yeah. That because be I, I feel like some of, you know, I'm an Australian. I'm a proud Australian. But a lot of these symptoms are actually a part of what Austra- has built Australia, right? To not you know, to be very hardworking, but you would never boast about it. You know what I mean? You, you have problems, but you don't share it with your family. You don't share it or you don't put your, you know, the saying laundry, something to do with the laundry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I would be really curious on it. Maybe you even have some information about how this shows up in different countries. I have gotten some feedback about that. I mean, I'm limited. I've been in the United States. I did live in Europe for a year, but it was, you know, way back when. And I'm from the South. So, you know, of course, and I'm 65 years old. So that, you know, and I'm white. And, you know, there are other things that I can't get about. So I've had some people write me and say, well, what is, you know, is there a cultural part of this? And of course there is. And so, you know, I, Kimberly, it's been interesting to me because I'm not trying to write a, in fact, I wrote a paragraph in the book. I don't know if you saw it or not, knowing that when I finished this book, that it would be imperfect, that there would be chapters that should have been written. And probably this is one of them. (laughs) You know, what does this look like in different cultures? For example, in some cultures, a family, I've written some about enmeshment before, and in some families and in, in cultures, enmeshment is very normal. 
you know, there's people don't necessarily, children don't gain a lot of independence until far into adulthood. So people written me and saying, but that's normal in our, and so, you know what? I realize these are ideas that, that are rooted in American culture, but I'm simply trying to put forth an idea to get people thinking and helps them to look at themselves more closely and more clearly, whether we call it perfectly hidden depression, whether we call it, I don't care what we call it, as long as we call it something that's going on is not, it's not helping people feel better. It's tearing them down on the inside. Right, right. No, and and when I compare to Australia, I actually feel like they would be equal in the presentation of this, if not more, because of that societal. Real, yes. You know, suicide rates are very high in Australia. Um, wow. You know, this presentation is very common in Australia as well. So I actually think, you know, our culture might even be, you know, really boasting, pushing this up. Wow, I didn't know that. I actually have plans to visit your country soon. Yeah, just not right now. (laughs) It's kind of like this. And yeah, well, I'm not even going to do that. They're having a lot of tragedy. So So I want to learn from people. I email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com and say, I agree with this part, but this part, you know, what about this? And for the first time, this was so exciting to me. And I was so honored. A, a A young man to me young walked in this week successful person in our community uh, and actually nationally and walked in with a book in his hand and said, I need to learn from this, this is me. And, you know, whether it's him to a T, I will learn from him. I will learn some other aspect of perfectly hidden depression that I'm clueless about right now. And so your comment is another one. I'm just adding to a trove of comments about, of course, there, we need to write more about this. You know, I'm wanting to begin a conversation and to ignite a conversation about it. Right. And you have, you have, I was read, actually, I highlight, I highlight books when I read them. (laughs) And I was just like, when, you know, when you're like highlighting and then you look at the page and the whole page was highlighted. (laughs) So this, I was like, what's, I'm highlighting everything because it was like, yes, I just was saying, yes, yes, this, this is this person. And I was just like pulling all these stories together. I think you did an amazing job of not only revealing this, but explaining it and giving some hope to this, you know, difficult, you know, syndrome or experience. Absolutely. Thank you. You're so very welcome. It has been, writing the book nearly killed me, actually. I think I was talking to my primary care physician and he was laughing. He goes, I think I've treated every system of yours, your stomach, your heart, (laughs) your your, you know, everything, everything has gone awry because of the stress of writing this. But I've learned a lot and I continue to learn a lot and I want to continue to learn a lot. This is not the be all end all. I just want it, as I said a few minutes ago, to ignite a conversation and an awareness that depression doesn't always look the same. And we've got to wake up to that. Absolutely. I, I'm so grateful for your work here. How can people hear about you, get in contact with you? Tell me sure. everything. It's drmargaretrutherford.com is my website. My podcast is the Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. That's S-E-L-F-W-O-R-K. I am, let me see, I've told you my email, ask Dr. Margaret, drmargaretrutherford.com. I'm on Instagram, Pinterest, and my Facebook is drmargaretrutherford.com. I also have a closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self work. So that's facebook.com slash group slash self work. And we have people from all over the world in that group. It is really a vibrant and wonderful group to have. So uh, I'd love to have any of your listeners there as well. I think they would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.